Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. We will begin in a minute. Um, we're just trying to set up everything. We have interpretation uh, from English into Spanish, so please uh, go to the back of the room and get your interpretation equipment. Thank you. And then Hello, friends. Welcome to our side event. I'm Kevin Curry from the Ford Foundation. Thank you for being here. This is an event that we've co-organized with Cultural Survival. And before we do anything, I'd like everyone to give a big thank you to Brian from Cultural Survival, who's in the back, who has made all of this possible for us. So thank you, Brian. <laughs> We're still sorting out some technical issues. We do ho hope to have three speakers join us remotely. but in order to keep you from just sitting here idly, we're gonna start. So thanks for being here. What we're hoping to do today is unpack the concept of just energy transition, or JET as it's now called. And when something becomes an acronym, you know that it's finally made it as a buzzword. Um, but what we've noticed is that the just part of just energy transition is falling off the discussion. And that's what we really want to unpack today. When we say just energy transition, what makes an energy transition just? 
And we can think about it in terms of different notions of justice, which sometimes actually compete with each other. So justice for communities that are affected by mineral extraction necessary for energy transition. Justice for households who lack access to energy in the first place. Justice for workers who may lose their livelihoods because of an energy transition. Justice questions within and between countries. Justice with respect to future generations and so on and so forth. A and these justices don't necessarily align. And so whose justice or which justice is centered matters a lot. And that dictates what kinds of compromises will be necessary to achieve a just energy transition. In particular, one of the big trends that we're noticing and that I would say is one of the costs of climate change that's not really being discussed is the cost of an energy transition in terms of communities in and around mineral resources that will be necessary to build the renewable energy that we will need to make energy transition possible. And what we know is that extraction of these metals and minerals, the so-called critical minerals for the energy transition, are having already impacts on frontline communities, on indigenous peoples, on rural areas, which mirror very closely the kinds of impacts that we see from extraction of coal, fossil fuels, and other kinds of metals and minerals. And of course, the history of extraction is one that's been riddled with instances of rights violations, of abuses, of inequality, dispossession. And so our concern is how to have an energy transition that will require extraction of new resources without putting all of the costs on that extraction on the same communities who always have bared those costs. And that's one of the hard truths that we have to confront, um, that a rapid transition in our energy system will require a rapid increase in extraction. And that's a truth that we don't think has been spoken about enough. But it's also one that poses these same difficult questions of justice that I've been describing. So what I'm hoping we can do today is focus at this intersection of competing notions of justice and in particular the impact on indigenous peoples, local communities, frontline communities who are likely to experience harmful impacts of extraction that will produce goods that will be necessary for the energy transition. How do we make it different this time so that these communities don't shoulder all of the burdens, all of the harms without receiving any of the benefits? And to help us unpack this question a bit more, we have a wonderful group of panelists. So here with me, we have Leslie Munoz from Opal in Chile. We have Badi Balde from the Extractive Industry Transparency Index. We have hopefully joining us online, Ikal Angale from Friends of Lake Turkana, Kenya. And also here with us in the room, we have Rodian Sulianzaza who uh, will talk to us about how this uh, issues are in impacting indigenous peoples of the north. And we also hope to be joined by Galina Angarova from Cultural Survival. I'm not sure that we have anyone with us yet online. So uh, Galina was going to make some introductory remarks, but we'll come back to her. If it's OK with you, then uh, Leslie, I'm going to start with you. Um, what does just energy transition mean for your community? Um, let me just ask you that simple question. Good morning to all of you. My name is Leslie Munoz. I belong to an IP from Chile. And I am a part of Plurinational Salares Andinos Observatory, which is an organization dedicated to preservation of 
uh, in Chile, and we are articulated with indigenous communities as well as with non-indigenous uh, peoples who are interested in preserving nature, which are and certain ecosystems that are very important for fauna and for the ecosystems. It's a collaboration, promoting collaboration, also preserving the rights of IPs and their ways of living. I am also a part of Cultural Survival Delegation for COP27, which is an organization, an IP organization that has over 50 years of experience, and I want to thank them for opening the opportunity for my community to be here, and especially for promoting uh, women and indigenous people and showcasing it not only at the local level but also at the international level. If you would like to learn more about cultural survival, you may do so by visiting www.culturalsurvival.org. Now I'm going to speak about my community, which is located in the pre-Indian mountain range, which is about an hour and a half away from the south flat from Maricunga. It is rich in copper, gold, as well as, as, well as lithium, and it and therefore is very it's a st strategic for national organizations as well as international organizations and companies. I am here to show the reality of our IPs that live close to these South Flats and the cost associated with this transition to extract salt from the Salt Flats, they have to pump water with salt from the inner to the outer spay area of the salt flats. And this, uh, through th the process, is to evaporate salt through the sun. And so it's very difficult to extract liters of water to extract the salt, and then finally lithium. This requires two millions of liters of salt and water, and, and this entails a lot of fresh water to extract lithium. So in my community, the main problem with the salt flats is lack of wa water. And uh, Andean people, the Koya people, depend on water. We move through water. Therefore, when water melts, we go up to 30,000 meters over sea level to feed our animals, to feed them um, for them to be fed through our pasture. And when now things change the way they have, we have to go further up. And uh, this need to face climate change will entails reducing greenhouse gases, and the best way to do so is through working with uh, strategic minerals, and therefore many think that green energy is the solution, which is a misnomer. Uh, clean energy, sure, it sounds nice, sounds like a solution, but my territory it's suffering as a result of the solutions that are being set forth at this time. In the Maricuga Salt Flat, two lithium projects have been approved. One invalidated by the Supreme Court of my country, and the other one it has been stopped because it's being challenged in the courts. Why? Because neither one applied for a consultation process with indigenous peoples that live in those areas. The company owners identified who the affected people would be there, but not us, not the ones living there, but other communities. And what did the government of Chile did about it? Nothing. They simply went ahead with what they said.
So we were not considered as part of the indigenous consultation, which is expected as the ILO 169 convention, which the government of Chile uh, subscribed. Other communities were even less fortunate than ours because there was, there was no intervention in our territories, but in others, they were very unfortunate to have their salt flats to be affected by extraction or extractive industries such as Atacama one. Now, the Carantai people are the ones that have been protecting those areas. That is the l largest exporter of lithium in the world currently, as a matter of fact, ba based on 2020 figures. The Atacama salt flag includes um, uh, water, bodies of water which are being affected thus affecting the local economy of indigenous peoples. The government of Chile ha states that the, uh, what the area produces as opposed to, I'm going to talk about recharge of the salt water in, in comparison what it actually produces is unfavorable, highly unfavorable currently, and then there is a company, in, an American company that has been drying up some of the river waters to produce lithium in the salt flat. And then Salinas Grandes is another one as well as Huayacayoque in Argentina, which an Australian auto cobre started exploiting or exploring without free prior in informed consent of indigenous peoples, which has also been happening in Chile. Uh, indigenous peoples are not being consulted. Same thing has happened t in Puyuni, in Gold Pass, in Bolivia. S people ask me, what's the cost of this tr energy transition? Well, in, in the Andean nations, our degradation, environmental problems, social problems, and the fact that there's no free prior informed consent and there's a violation of the human rights of indigenous peoples. Companies and governments must keep in mind the consequence of this transition onto indigenous people. The extractivism has to change, has to move away from those territories, and if anything, a consultation has to take place. This is imperative, and it has to be free, prior, and informed throughout the entire process, and it has to be based on good faith. That's a basic... Um, tenant that has already established and has been and must apply to this. This has been part of what has been negotiated in the different COPs and with, this, uh, with many different governments, and still, all of this is not fair to indigenous peoples at the end of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leslie, for explaining the risks of this transition without justice or the effects of it. We will now be joined by Galina Angarova from Cultural Survival. And Galina, what I'd like to ask you is a, a very similar question to what I asked Leslie. We're hearing a lot of discussion now in international circles about just energy transition. What does just energy transition mean so far for indigenous peoples and what could it mean? don't hear you, unfortunately. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. All right, I, I can, wonderful. And I can hear my voice, unfortunately. Oh, I don't. Oh, okay, I'll, shall begin. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for the question. I also wanted to thank Ford Foundation for organizing this session with us. Again, my name is Galina Angarova, and I come from the Abzai clan of the Iherit Nation of the Buryat peoples in Siberia. I'm an indigenous rights activist, and I serve as the ex executive director of cultural survival. I go by she, her, and I am uh, connecting from the unceded territories of the Ohlone people, which is now known as the San Francisco Bay Area. 
And just a little bit about uh, cultural survival. We are a veteran indigenous-led, indigenous rights organization with 50 years of experience working in uh, to protect indigenous people's rights and support indigenous people's self-determination, cultures, and political resilience. We work through a holistic strategy and wraparound programming, supporting indigenous communities through advocacy, capacity building, grant making, and communications. And on the nexus of several themes, such as climate change solutions by indigenous peoples, lands and livelihoods, community media. To answer your question uh, about what just transition is, I would say that the term is relatively new. It has been largely developed by a heterogeneous group of various movements with different goals, values, and understanding of the concept um, as a response to the multiple crisis that the humanity is currently facing, including the biggest double crisis. Uh, that's why we're here today, right? It's the crisis of climate change and biodiversity loss. We have first seen references to just transition from the trade union movement, which were quickly picked up by environmentalists, climate change activists, and conservation groups, and so on. But as such, there's really not a single definition of just transition that is com uh, comprehensive enough or is able to satisfy all movements all groups and stakeholders and right holders. A more comprehensive definition uh, that we find ourselves in alignment with is the definition by the Climate Justice Alliance that defines just transition as the vision-led, unifying, and place-based set of principles, processes, and practices that build economic and political power to shift from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy. This means approaching production and consumption cycles holistically and waste-free. The transition itself must be just and equitable, redressing past harms and creating new relationships of power for the future through reparations. And if the process of transition is not just, the outcome will never be. So we are in alignment with this definition. So in particular, there are varying visions of the word just. In some communities, just signifies the right and the ability to vote for groundbreaking legislation uh, that can support the just transition to circular economy. Well, in other communities, it might mean that having, having safety and security transitioning to new livelihood yeah, economies uh, for example, coal mining uh, communities in uh, economies of scale such as India. What does the word just mean for them? What does the word just mean shifting 150 million people who are directly or indirectly engaged in the coal mining industry? What does just mean to keep their families um, uh, going, to keep feed feeding their families? And what does it mean for indigenous peoples whose lives and survival as people are directly contain the highest concentrations of transition minerals needed for this transition? So these are the questions that we have moving into this conversation today. And as you've heard Leslie, Leslie's presentation, um, whose territories are already impacted by uh, the rush, the gold rush, the new gold rush to for transition minerals. And defining the term of just transition and understanding how we achieve it requires that we take into account a wide diversity of problems and develop solutions that are appropriate to a given context. At Cultural Survival, we have always advocated for local and place-based solutions, and we rest in the same stance the just transition has to be highly localized and take on a contextual approach. And to further the case of the just transition, it's important that we all engage constructively and collectively define the common principles of the just transition. And one, of course, being the centrality of human rights, justice, and equity at all times throughout the transition. These principles are just not negotiable. 
And speaking of human rights, we're talking about the full spectrum of human rights, including the collective rights of indigenous peoples and our right to free prior and informed consent. Just quickly to mention what we're doing to ensure the rights of indigenous peoples are um, upheld uh, and respected during this transition. On um, August 9th, uh, the World's Indigenous Peoples Day, Cultural Survival, along with four other partner organizations, First Peoples Worldwide, Otani Foundation, Earthworks, and Society for Threatened Peoples released an official public announcement about the launch of a new coalition, which is named Securing Indigenous Peoples' Rights in a Green Economy, or SIRG Surge Coalition. And we also launched a new website, uh, www.surgecoalition.org. Uh, and this work, this coalition is the result of two and a half years of engagement, trust building, joint advocacy, planning strategy, and hard work of a number of groups, uh, um, of a number of organizations and groups of individuals. Uh, we are a coalition of indigenous leaders, indigenous and allied organizations who champion a just transition to a low carbon economy. And our primary goal is to elevate indigenous leadership, cultures, spiritual traditions, history, and especially our right to determine our own priorities to our lands, territories, and resources. And as a coalition, we call for a full implementation of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, including, the free to, uh, including the right to free, prior, and informed consent, and all endeavors related to the extraction, mining, production, consumption, sale, and recycling of transition minerals around the world. And I, I just want us to pause here, um, given that we are uh, already at um, 15 minutes before the top of the hour, and I, we're going to give it back to you, Kevin. And if we have time at the end, I can come in with some other uh, additions and comments and feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much, Galina. Mm -hmm. I want to see if we can go to a call, Angele, from Friends of Lake Turkana in Kenya. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, we can hear you very well. She wanted to be with us here in person and is on the way to the COP, but has been uh, way late due to flight delays. Um, so we'll be joining virtually. Thank you for making the time to be with us, even as you're traveling. Two questions I wanted to ask you. First of all, you started your career um, fighting against the dam. So I'm curious to hear whether you see a role for hydroelectric energy in the energy transition. The second question is, you know, since then your work has taken you all over Africa, especially across East Africa. What are you seeing on the ground in terms of how communities are experiencing the energy transition right now? Thanks, thanks, Kevin, and thank you to the Ford Foundation and Cultural Survival for this, for coming together for this uh, uh, convening. I think for me, first, I must recognize Cultural Survival was one of the first organizations that we worked with in 2009 when we started campaigning against the Giza Dam. And Ford Foundation has been a partner for almost a decade now, so you know I, I have to recognize that. Um, so to, to the question, um, one. One thing is the fight for energy justice for us has been, it's not today. So mostly we're talking about the just energy transition, but for us it's been just you know, energy justice, that the development of energy projects, um, especially hydro dams, has constantly created a cost to local communities, led to displacement, actually destroyed ecosystems, uh, that in its own way has created a climate crisis uh, for many of the communities who depend on their lands and territories for, the, for their survival. So. So as, as many people have joined this just energy transition, many of us have been, especially communities across the global south especially, have been fighting for against dams uh, for a long time just because of the way it is very extractive in its own way. It, it's huge, especially huge dams. So to answer the question, I think there is a place for dams, but then we've got to go back to the World's Recommendation, the World Commission on Dams Recommendations. 
and, and really understand what were, the, what were the challenges around hydro dams that were highlighted then, and this was almost two decades ago, um, and how that those recommendations can play into the way that the, the, the dams uh, construction happens. And in many cases, it's got to be centered around creatives. Uh, I will reiterate what Galina said, the free plan from consent, the communities have got to be uh, cons consulted and, and, and consent happens. And sadly, the way the free plan from consent is structured, it only happens at the beginning of the project, but the, the implications and the impacts to communities is, is long-term and it's much, it's longer term. I'll give an example with the Grand Dinga in, in the DRC. It's the huge, it's the largest dam in Africa, which is being built in the Grand Dinga. But the energy that is being generated is not to supply and support the DRC communities. It is to be supplied to the to the minerals. Again, minerals that are needed for the, 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 the critical minerals that are needed for the energy transition. So you see this very extractive model that is around energy for whom, who's, who's this energy being, being um, generated for. And so having come from history of, of struggling against them, seeing not only the displacement of communities, the disenfranchisement of communities, but also the human rights violations by their governments. And, and, and I think from personal experiences at that particular time, a lot of the NGOs who were fighting against fossil fuels were telling us to step aside because they were fighting the good fight. And we were just fighting a losing battle in their opinion, because for them, the fight, you know, moving away from fossil fuels was the struggle. And yes, it is important for us to move away from fossil fuels, but it cannot be a conversation that continues to ignore the local costs on communities. And local costs is not only based on displacement, but it is also on disenfranchisement of their identity, their sense of belonging, their cultures, who they are, you know, the separation of communities. And, and going to the second question, when you think about the, the energy transition, it's, it's wind energy, it is, it is, it's hydropower, it is solar energy, most of this, and then before we go to the critical minerals, so if you look at S3, this happened on lands, and, and most of the areas don't have lands, so if you look at the lands that are targeted, the indigenous people and local communities lands, land that is actually, is sometimes viewed by, by governments as idle land, pastoralism, for some, pastoralism is the use of rangelands. And so because you move from place to place in such a pasture, sometimes when you're leaving the land to regenerate, it is seen as idle land. Give an example, the Lake Turkana Wind Power. This is a, the largest wind, wind project in the continent that sitting in, in the pastoralist region. This was land that was taken away by the government as seen as idle land and, and a wind project put there. Yes, a noble project, but consultation with the communities was ignored. The livelihoods of communities was ignored. And the compensation is equal to 200 euros. What well, is 200 euros when you're taking away lands that belong, lands and territories that belong to communities? So this is some of the struggles we're seeing, and it is not specific to 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 Kenya because last two years ago, when the Kenyan courts passed a ruling that indicated that the land was taken legally, illegally, and that there should be a process. Sadly, the Kenyan government, the Kenyan courts said, we give you a year to 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 uh, legitimize the process. The same time in Norway, which is the global north, uh, the Sami community, which are indigenous, had a ruling that basically indicated that also their land for a wind project was taken illegally. They have a different process, while we, we, you know, we have a different process. But when you look at, but when you look at how the discussion is happening, the discussion is happening around we need to transition. And no one is talking about it. One is ensuring that the local voices of communities are on the table. That you know agreements are being made by governments. Look at the DRC with the with the batteries. Look at uh, Zimbabwe uh, with with the with the minerals that are being found. Look at Madagascar. Governments are signing to for for especially the global north to and, and my, multinational companies to come and mine these resources. But no one is talking about communities. And and sadly, even the civil society space. Yes, I'm heading to the COP and I'm hearing the discussion around. You know the shift, the shift to, to 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 renewable energy, but no one is having conversations with communities. There is not enough space, enough platforms where communities themselves understand what minerals are in their are on their lands and territories, what it means for the extraction of these minerals, what it means for possible displacement, and the assumption that these lands are not valuable. So the focus is on you know, IFF, illicit financial flows, what happens, but the valuation of the lands 
and beyond material valuation is missing. So you see a disconnect of a conversation that is very global, that doesn't understand that the local costs of communities and how communities should come to the table and have a discussion around how this happens. But for as long as we continue with a very extractive model, an exclusive model of, 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 of development, there will be no difference with the energy transition, especially for local communities. And sadly, the carbon crisis is not only issues related, the climate crisis is not related only to carbon. It is related to land use, it is related to forest destruction, and it is related to the displacement of communities. So we've got to look at it holistically and ensure that we're actually using a human rights-based approach, but we are centering it around people and, and their livelihoods, their cultures, but also their, 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 what, what aspirations they have in terms of development. So from the East African context, I see that, but also from the, from the, you know, the African context. And, 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 and just to add that even as we think about this energy transition from the African context, at the moment, the minerals will go. I mean, right now we're already seeing extraction of minerals, whether with the Guinea coup, the, the, the companies are still talking about how they can continue to mine uh, from Guinea and, 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 and take the minerals out, but there is no value addition. So the model of extraction and taking resources from the African continent and the global south will continue unless we really are able to restructure how development happens from the global south and not necessarily to, to address the needs of the global north. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's turn now to Vede Balde from the Extractive Industry Transparency Index, EITI. Two questions that I wanted to ask you. So first of all, we've heard a little bit about some of the community level impacts of energy transition. What does the EITA process offer for communities that are experiencing these kinds of impacts? Second question is to get us a bit into another dimension of the way the energy transition will affect communities, and that is in terms of what kinds of revenue shifts you expect to see because of the energy transition, and how does that affect benefit sharing going down to local communities? Um, <coughs> thank you, Kevin, and thank, thanks for uh, inviting us here. I had some slides, but I will leave them alone because and to address specifically your questions here. Um, to your first question on what the EHI process, uh, can, how the EHI process can contribute to addressing this issue of uh, community engagement. Um, we, ad our end, the, I think it's been said here by a number of uh, panelists who are here today and over the conference this week, that we all see that the, as we, the energy transition gather pace, we see increase in demand for a certain type of minerals. Um, some of them are demand is projected to grow by twofold, fourfold, uh, even to ninefold, depending on the prevailing technology and the pace of the of the transition. And what is interesting here is that those minerals are uh, not always concentrated. They, they tend to be concentrated in. in is in local places, so you have the lithium triangle in the Andes, and you have the copper belt in, in, in Africa, and so on. And as a result of that, the, 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 the increase in demand will put pressure on the, the way communities how that will be affected by this. There are some opportunities for some communities to benefit from it uh, if we get it right, but there we all recognize that there are substantial risks that needs to be mitigated against here. So how do we go about in addressing this? We have two uh, approaches to this. One is providing relevant data uh, to, to local communities to ensure that they have access to relevant information and that they have voice to decision making to affecting them. So first on the data, we, the EITI standard, for some of you who are not very familiar with it, has been developed in through various iterations over the last uh, uh, 20 years or so. Uh, it, ha it is right now implemented by about 60 EITI implementing countries. It is implemented at the national level. It calls for transparency and good governance of the, the, or the natural resources across the entire value chain. And 
It requires the disclosure of information on all aspects related to the extractive revenues, uh, extractive sector, be that on the licensing, on how, who owns the license, which contracts are signed between mining companies and government, uh, the, the, the production that is, how, who is producing what, and who is exporting what, and how payments are made to the government, and how payments are made to local communities, or how payments made to government are transferred to local communities or not. Uh, so, that's so those are some of the things that the EHR reporting seek to, to address. And that information needs to be provided at the national level and sometimes at the local level. So if you see, we have a project, in fact, with the Ford Foundation right now, which are piloting in Ghana, Colombia, and Indonesia, uh, where we, in addition to work we have already done in Peru and, and, and Argentina in particular, where we go beyond the national level disclosures to go to the community, community level disclosures. What type of information is needed here? And on the, part, on the second leg, which is the participation, uh, creating a forum for dialogue between civil society, companies, and government, we are trying to move that from the central level, again, to the community level. And there, the, we have a number of two mechanisms in place within the EHI standards. The first is the EHI protocol, co the protocol for civil society. What the protocol calls for is essentially uh, that communities have freedom of expression, they have freedom of association, they have the freedom to, to, of operation, so they create their own associations and they can operate freely without fear of reprisals. They have the freedom to engage in these processes, and more importantly, they have access to decision making. And this is the point that was made earlier about free, prior, and informed consent. Where such laws exist, EHI requires that they are followed, that those consultations are meaningful, and that community's voice is taken into consideration on how those, it, whether it is licensing issues or in cases that requires uh, moving communities for in the interest of a mine and so on, how that is done. Uh, all the way to the end of the life cycle of the mine as well, because what we shouldn't forget the fact that energy transition also means that certain type of minerals will be gradually uh, declining and eventually fa phased out, uh, so, such as coal. But there again, there are, as you said, your point at the introduction is very much spot on that justice here is very much context specific because for some communities there that's whose livelihood depends on such mines, actually in, in Colombia there are a few mines there that's uh, at local level on uh, coal mining, for example, in Colombia or Afghanistan and so on, that local communities strongly depend on those. Uh, we hear more about coal miners in the US and so on because they have a voice, uh, but there are other communities where they don't have that voice. So here, rather than having a value judgment to say this, you must do this, you must do that, we are less prescriptive on the outcome but rather provide a framework, if you will, for first the disclosure of the relevant information, and then secondly, the process for consultative pro uh, the pro consultation and decision making. And that process has to be meaningful. Uh, it has to, the onus is on the government who are the members who subscribe to the EHI uh, to adhere to those EHI principles and requirements. The onus is on them to uh, ensure that their own laws are followed and that international best practices are followed as they, they, they manage the sector. So that's in overall, that is in a way uh, the EHI in, in, in a nutshell. It is implemented at central and lo local level. We do have a quality assurance mechanism at the international level, which is that for all EHI member countries, we, ha we call it validation. So every three years, we review for all our member countries whether they are in, in adherence with their performance, if you will, against 
the EHR principles, the, the transparency requirements, uh, and the, the space for, for dialogue therein. Similarly, on the company side, we, could, we also have about 60 or so oil, gas, and mining companies who are supporters of the EHR. There again, there are expectations for how companies should adhere to such high standards of um, uh, environmental standards, as well as adherence to national laws uh, and, and sustainability framework. So, and against mitigating against risk of corruption in the due diligence processes and so on. And there again, there is a review process on how, whether com companies are in adherence uh, with those. So collectively, we think that we can contribute to the work going forward here as the, uh, the, the, the demand for these minerals intensify, the competition intensifies, and the, uh, the need for more and more. Uh, we hope eventually we'll get to a circularity where recycling also plays a role because it cannot be just about uh, more and more extraction but there is a way to manage this in such a way to mitigate against the harmful impact to, to the environment and to local communities, as well as to maximize the benefits to the citizens as those minerals are produced. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now let's turn over to Rodion Soyanjiga from the Center for Support for Indigenous Peoples of the North wanted to also ask you two questions, Rydian. So first of all, to hear a bit about how this is playing out in the Russian context for indigenous peoples and local communities. And then secondly, to ask you, because I've seen you now in many COPs, many UN spaces, what's happening here this week or in the negotiations in the UN process in the efforts to get more financing for indigenous peoples and local communities that might be useful for this discussion of just transition. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Cultural Survival and Port Foundation for bringing us together, particularly focusing on this very specific issue, transition minerals, because uh, one of the most urgent issues today particular after pandemic time is economic recovery. But who pay? Who will be the winner? Who will be the loser? So that is still a big question. And I think it it's, uh, should be discussed openly, uh, including all right holders and stakeholders. Um, my name is Rodion Sunizga and uh, I am uh, indigenous activists from the Russian Eastern Siberia. I've been actively engaged into the uh, indigenous advocacy for many years at local levels, but also at the United Nations level. And I will start with uh, bringing a Russian case. Uh, it's a negative case uh, of uh, minerals story, um, focusing on uh, Nord Nikil, it's the biggest uh, corporation to produce a different kind of minerals in the Russian Arctic. In May uh, 2020, uh, near the city of Norilsk in Siberia, Taimir region, more than 20,000 tons of diesel were spilled into tundra, resulting in the heavy pollution of rivers and lake. And this accident is one of the worst environmental disaster that ever inflicted upon the Arctic this century. According to the uh, environments, they can compare only with the 1989 Exxon Wilders disaster happened in Alaska. And North Nickel is the world largest producer of nickel and palladium and the mineral is necessary for renewable energy, surely. Nickel, lithium, cobalt, and copper are still very critical to the development of green, low-carbon economy. As demand for these transition minerals is skyrocketing, increased mining 
threatens indigenous rights and territories where there is not a comprehensive assessment of risk and harms to indigenous peoples and complete participation of indigenous peoples who are impacted. And we as Russian indigenous peoples decided to appeal to someone to grab international headlines. And that was Elon Musk from Tesla, who is focusing on battery and green economy oriented. We don't want the next industrial revolution of electric cars and clean energy developed for the price of indigenous people's rights in their traditional land. And the globe goal of this campaign against Nornikil was to use a public name like Elon Musk as an instrument to attract more attention to the Arctic, to the Arctic pollution, and to the rights of indigenous peoples. And we were quite success. Finally, Tesla rejected to sign a big contract with Nornikil. But again, reflecting on the Russian indigenous people's situation, who are today the most invisible groups among the world's indigenous people. Many of us are cut off from the rest of the world because of political and military situation, but at the same time are completely ignored, criminalized, and what is more, wiped out and silenced by their own government. So, uh, and of course we need, we need uh, your solidarity. We need solidarity amongst indigenous peoples. But it's really a horrible and heartbreaking situation still. And with regards to the, uh, how we are, we are watching here at the COP. And we don't understand also very well that uh, in many parts of the world, like US, Brazil, Peru, Amazonka, the transition minerals debates rise, rises different levels of concern from indigenous communities whose territories are honed to significant proportion of green minerals. And conflicts are set to multiply. At the heart of the battles between mining companies and indigenous peoples is the issue of consent or to be more precise, lack thereof. We do understand the importance of any kind of progress, of any kind of technology, but yet again, it is indigenous peoples who pay the price. And after effects cannot always be predicted. These are often cumulative. Historically, in clash with business, Indigenous peoples seems to lose on all fronts, on all fronts, prior to the projects, during the projects, and not to, not to mention the damages they are left to deal with after the project ends. Sadly, till today, indigenous communities, like no, no other peoples, depend for their security and prosperity on good intentions of those who still rule them. But indigenous empowerment is not a matter of course. This is political achievement. And our main mission being here as a global indigenous movement fighting for our political rights. And of course today we are hearing more and more about financing. Financing, direct access of indigenous people to finance, but there are still too much obstacles, too much barriers we are still facing with. And finally, we are also here to discuss different kinds of options or compromise on the way to make solution. Option A, option B, option C. But there is no planet B, there's only one planet. That is, I think, the main issue we would like to put on the table to find solution. Climate is still changing, so, we sh so should we. And we as indigenous peoples contribute so little, so little to the climate catastrophe. 
yet we have the knowledge to tackle. And still, we have no power. We have no political power, I hope. But we are not potential actors in climate change battle. We are one of the solution. That's why we are here. Thank you. much. Uh, we'll go to our last speaker now and after that we'll have a good amount of time for questions so please get your questions ready. Turning now to Tony Bebbington who's the director of natural resources and climate change at the Ford Foundation and my boss so pay attention. Um, what we're going to do here is get some closing reflections from Tony um, about how, how this panel makes us think differently about what the Ford Foundation should be doing in this space. H how is Ford and how should Ford grapple with the question of justice in energy transition? What are the patterns that you're seeing across how Ford Foundation partners are experiencing and working on this issue? And what do you see as the place of community rights and especially indigenous rights in the way that Ford Foundation responds? Thanks, Kevin. You hear me? Great, yes, great. we do. Thank you. So, well, first of all, thank you to all the speakers for sharing your insights and your perspectives. It's been, um, it's been both rich and sobering. So, to try and respond to your questions, Kevin, I'd say that you know, while Ford is a, it goes by the label of being a social justice organization. In the case of energy transition maybe in case of all issues, but in the case of energy transition, it's not easy to get a handle on the nature of justice or the different justices at stake. That's not just because of the distinctions between different types of justice, procedural, distributive, restorative, and the like. But I think the bigger challenge or the bigger issue is that so many actors are affected by system-wide energy transitions. And what they're experiencing as injustices in those transitions is quite varied quite distinct. So as we've heard today, this morning, for communities that are at the site of extraction of critical minerals, these injustices relate to displacement, loss of territory for livelihood, for their cultural expression and existence, environmental impacts, health impacts, and so on and so on. And in these cases also, it's been touched on a little bit, those sorts of injustices easily get compounded by, by other dimensions of injustice. There's, there's the impact injustices, there's the absence of any real prior consultation around these investments, which is another injustice, and without any significant sharing or any real meaningful sharing of benefits of these extractive activities on the territories and lands of these communities. One more injustice. But beyond those community experienced injustices that we've talked mostly about today, there are also the injustices faced by workers in the hydrocarbon sector who will lose their jobs as energy systems move out, move out of thermal coal and away from oil powered vehicles. And these are other dimensions of injustice, not just the loss of the jobs, but the loss of jobs in ways that is generally unconsulted and at best poorly, poorly compensated, if at all. And then there are a range of other injustices that that enter the equation that happen across, if you like, the energy chain. There's the injustices suffered by those who have no access or very limited access to energy. And in some cases for whom future short-term and medium-term access might not easily be resolved by renewables. Um, there's the injustices as some have mentioned today faced by communities when renewable projects are placed on their lands again in a way that is often unconsulted and uncompensated. There are the injustices experienced by future generations whose life options are constrained and again without consultation because these generations are not yet born by climate change and who therefore would gain from rapid decarbonization of energy and their, their rights would be enhanced by rapid decarbonization of energy. Um, even when some of that rapid decarbonization in the present raises challenges of justice for contemporary communities. And then there are also the injustices suffered by nature itself, 
where biological life is taken away by resource extraction and by pollution. And once again, in ways that it's obviously not used to consult nature, but it's worth recognizing that those injustices suffered by nature are themselves not consulted. So all these different groups are paying for transition. So the payment question is not just a question of finance, it's a question of who's paying these costs along the way. And I think thinking about Ford, but thinking about the session as well, those justices don't easily align. And maybe they cannot, they can't ever fully align. And I think we at Ford, and you can comment on this as well, Kevin, grapple with that challenge of alignment. And I don't think we're alone in that grappling with the challenge of aligning these different injustices. We struggle to think across those different injustices without unduly privileging one of them, while also not saying that every injustice is the same. Um, and the risk internally within a foundation like Ford and presumably within other uh, organizations is that some programs end up prioritizing one set of experienced injustices, other programs prioritize other injustices, and we, we fail to grasp the energy system as a whole network of interlinked justices and injustices. Um, and so I think the challenge for us, thinking about your question about specifically about Ford, is yes, to recognize and work on the injustices that have been talked about today, but also find ways to relate these to other injustices across the energy chain and throughout the transition process. Um, my own sense there, which is not necessarily a Ford sense or even a program sense, is that the only successful and viable just energy transition is going to be one that's grounded in a broad coalition of actors who are affected in different ways by that transition. And as a coalition recognize a shared need for transition, can agree on where each actor will compromise in, a, in, in particular ways so that the transition deals in some way, but always in an imperfect way, with these different injustices. And through the coalition, so the actors are all equally aware of the trade-offs that each of them are making and the demands that each of them are making as part of building the collective sense of the justice that has to be negotiated in energy transition processes. Um, I mean, I think in practice for Ford, the way we're brought into these debates depends on our partners. And so in some instances, we're brought into these debates at the level of justice discussions around the overall transition and the packet of financing for that transition, as we did it, as in the work around the Just Energy Partnership in, in South Africa. And in other instances, we're brought in to focus specifically on the sort of issues that have been talked about today. And I think that's fine that we're brought into these debates in different partners. But the challenge of thinking across all the different injustices that are at stake across the energy chain and across the transition remains. Um, and I don't think we're there yet. Um, the only other thing I might add, because time's, time's moving on, is thinking about patterns that we see. And again, you could comment on this, Kevin. Um, see as Ford. I think they're very similar to the ones that have been talked about today. But I'm not sure, that it's not always the case that all actors have the same clarity of vision that speakers have expressed today. It's not always the case that local, the actors see local conflicts in relation to these larger energy transitions and economic transformations, and indeed rethinkings of development and of the social contract. Um, but where they do see these links, the potential is, is, is really great. Um, and the other thing I'd say, and then to, to, to wrap up, is, is around the issues of narratives. Um, th this is really a question to the panel, I suppose, as or a reflection to ask others to comment on. Um, but I do wonder whether there's some difference between the ways, the sort of narrative and the clarity of narrative that's been built up around indigenous peoples, territorial rights, land rights, forests, and climate change, and the relationships between indigenous peoples, commu uh, other communities also, land rights, and critical minerals, and the challenges of climate change. I mean, in the case of forests, the narrative is, is clear, clear, powerful, and indeed 
scientifically validated that goes that there's no pathway to 1.5 degrees or 2 degrees without forests. And that indigenous control of territory and governance of forests is consistently associated with a greater likelihood that those forests remain standing, and that therefore, ipso facto, supporting indigenous tenure in forest regions is both socially just on its own grounds and will help reduce deforestation and greenhouse gas emissions and therefore be a critical part of any climate solution. So in that sense, indigenous rights and tenure become core to a climate solution. I ask, I wonder whether, and with this I'll stop as a provocation, whether in the discussions around critical minerals and the sorts of injustices that we've been talking about today, whether we whether there is quite the same clarity and coherence and, and, and persuasiveness of a narrative that says in a similar way, the rights questions raised by the extraction of transitional, transition minerals and addressing those rights issues is in and of itself central to climate mitigation strategies. It's clearly central to a justice discussion, but whether the narrative has been built yet that makes it clear that it's central to climate change mitigation in the same way that the forest narrative and indigenous territorial rights narrative has been built is less clear to me. Um, I'm not sure, certainly not sure that we're there as a foundation, but I would be really interested to hear what panelists think about that. Anyway, thank you. Thank you everyone for such rich comments. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, tech friends in the back, do we have a microphone people can use to ask questions? Ah, okay, great. So what we'll do now is we'll take a handful of questions Please raise your hand if you have a question. Introduce yourself and let us know whether it's for a specific panelist or for the group. We'll take three or four of them and then I'll give each panelist uh, 90 seconds to respond and make any closing comments. So floor is open. Afternoon. Hello, hello. Good afternoon, thank you so much for a very interesting uh, panel. My name is Antonio Hill with the Natural Resource Governance Institute. Uh, we work with developing countries rich in oil, gas, and minerals to help them hurdle the energy transition. Um, and I was very interested in something the last speaker just said about how messy justice has become in the midst of all of these fast-moving challenges now, incredible pressures on the transition mineral side, of course. Uh, we need to increase cobalt something like 22 times current extraction rates. Lithium and other transition minerals are similar. Um, the pressure to use land for renewable energy and so on is likewise um, mounting fast. Um, and it's difficult to come up with a narrative that applies across the board um, and that serves to protect not just indigenous communities, but everyone in the space we're in. And in that context, there, has, there have been proposals for essentially defining a safe operating space that has a social floor and planetary ceiling for all of our activities, whether it's about mining for the clean energy economy, whether it's about new energy development um, for the energy transition. Um, and I wonder whether panelists would like to speak to um, the suitability of those kind of simple uh, proposals that help capture the broad range of rights that need to be, def be defended, excuse me, um, for everyone all at once as a way that we can all get around indigenous communities, marginal affected local communities all across the global south. Um, but indeed, these apply in the global north as well where consumption has exceeded those boundaries, um, even as um, social rights have been trampled and human rights uh, continue to be um, under, under uh, not met, um, even in the, the rich world. Thank you. Thank you. You can pass it right in front of you.
Thank you so much. My name is Sonkita Conte. I work for NAMATI, which is a legal empowerment organization, and uh, which also, <coughs> excuse me, which um, hosts a network of legal empowerment practitioners. I felt very sad listening to the panelists uh, talking about the experiences of indigenous communities. And for me, it is very clear that these communities and those that are also sitting on minerals are vulnerable and powerless. And as much as they try to organize among themselves and within themselves, they are still susceptible to the violence of the state, to the power of money from, um, from, from corporations. So my, my question is, how do we organize to ensure that we build power across indigenous communities, across countries, across continents, so that when we speak with one voice, we are able to make things happen? How do we get to that point? Thank you very much. Thank you. And I still have one more hand over here. Hi, thank you. Lindsay Allen, Climate Land Use Alliance. I'm curious if any of the indigenous panelists in particular have seen, but for all the panel, have seen examples of where FPIC happened and where uh, there's a good model of what things could look like, where extraction for green minerals is really driving the local economy, where uh, I'm seeing faces, so maybe that's giving me a sense of it, but I'd be curious if there are any examples of where there are benefits to the local community and particularly indigenous communities. Thank you, Lindsay. Three excellent questions. So we'll give every speaker a brief period to respond, uh, 90 seconds. Uh, Galena was one of the people I saw making a face in that last question. So let's start with you, Galena. would love to hear your answer to that and any of the other questions you'd like to respond to. Sure. Thank you, Kevin. Um, oh, I can, I'll, I'll start uh, responding to the third question, to the last question. Um, and I think my uh, colleagues uh, can contribute to that. I, I haven't personally um, encountered a single case, a perfect aspect, as prescribed uh, by the UN Declaration. Uh, there are many uh, aspects um, uh, kind of boilerplate floating you know, on the internet. There are some protocols, very uh, mm, good protocols by IFAD, for example, but many other organizations. But the most important thing is that the aspect protocols have to be developed by the communities themselves. That's their right. Um, and indigenous peoples as right holders have the right to define their own protocols and ways to engage with communities. Uh, but um, in my experience, I really haven't uh, seen um, a perfect um, ASIC protocol uh, implemented on the ground yet. But uh, uh, yeah, I think Rodio might have some uh, insights as well. But I actually wanted to respond to the second question. I thought it was really great. How do we organize? So um, as I mentioned um, in my presentation, we have come together to form the search coalition. And this is the way for us to organize. Uh, and we're tackling the problem on several fronts through advocacy, uh, through capacity building, communications, and grant making. Uh, we have uh, formed a group of indigenous advocates and we traveled from Brussels to Brussels for example, to advocate for inclusion of indigenous people's rights and references to the UN Declaration and free prior informed consent in the uh, groundbreaking upcoming legislation coming from Europe. It's the EU battery regulation, corporate due diligence law, raw materials act, and if we're able to insert some of the references and into that into those pieces of legislation that we have uh, an opportunity to to make uh, the rights of indigenous people for the first time, uh, probably to move them from non-binding agreements to, to, to a binding uh, legislative effort. So, so the one thing, we also at Cultural Survival um, launched a community response fund to support indigenous communities that are currently being affected or plan to be affected by transition minerals. 
and these funds will be available starting um, next year uh, to support their um, advocacy campaigns, their communications, on the ground uh, efforts. Uh, in terms of communications, please check out our new website, all the materials that we have collected or producing, um, uh, in what's happening on the ground in many different communities. And since we started this work, we got contacted by many communities around the world from, from the United States, from communities affected by lithium extraction uh, on Saka Pass, uh, in Salton Sea, um, um, Apache Stronghold in, in Arizona, there's lithium triangle uh, in Bolivia, Argentina, and Chile, there are communities in, Indo in uh, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, and many parts of the world. So, um, yeah, the, the work is ongoing, and if you want to be part of this work, uh, let us know. Thank you, Galina. Let, let's go to Rodian now, and we'll just come down the line. Yes, <coughs> thank you very much for raising this uh, question, which, of course, uh, uh, not so easy and uh, quite substantial. But before uh, trying to, to provide my feedback, <coughs> I would like to highlight some points. Indigenous peoples, we are nature-dependent communities. It means we need a lot of territories for our traditional lifestyle and to keep our, our own identity and to keep our, our own values and, and philosophy. So, and the second point, all of us, we are living in different political regimes. And I think this is true key issue we always have to keep in mind. Because the short issue, it's a legal framework. So that can, of course, provide for many of us some hope. But again, this first two big issue provide also a lot of challenges. With regards to FPIC, if you look at my country in Russia, I don't think so that we can provide such good positive things and the such authorities, authoritarian or military regime. If you look at some maybe Nordic states uh, or US and Canada, I think we can elaborate and to talk more. But we are, we are under the process of evaluation. With regards to the uh, very short recommendation and solution, for me, it's, it sounds very simple. What we need as indigenous peoples, we need to respect our rights, our basic rights, right for our self-determination, for our uh, land, and for our nature, which provide a lot of conflict of interest, of course, between private sector and government. That means we need to develop legal framework and legal commitment based on the United Nations international law, like Declaration on the Right of Indigenous Me Peoples, which provide minimum, minimum standards to all Indigenous peoples and globe. And I think it's enough. Thank you. I'm going to start with a third question about uh, FPIC, if it, whether it has worked. It, well, in my country, it hasn't worked. It's been applied. But in my country, the way it works is they don't ask us whether we want or not want to come into our home. They just get into our homes, and then they ask us whether what they're going to do is good or bad, and whether we have any comments about it. So that is the situation in Chile. In terms of the Atacama South Flat, there was no FPIC because w the extraction of lithium started during the dictatorship of Pinochet, so there was no FPIC in that case. I don't know of any cases in Chile where FPIC or whether consultation with IPs has worked and whether, and I don't know whether this consultation has worked. The question is whether there is a consultation or not. The other question is about how, what 
can we empower IPs? I think education is key in communities in my countries. We do not have people who have been to college. I had the privilege to attend college, but not everybody does, at least not in, uh, well, at least in Chile, you knew going to the university is a luxury. So the information that goes around in our communities is something very important because we need to organize ourselves to communicate this information and then bring this information at the global level to see how we can solve this problem. And in terms of viability of clean energies, I believe everything must focus on the uh, respecting and promoting human rights because this is key. This should be the, the key and the heart of everything that corporations do. I believe these would be my answers. I believe human rights are at the heart and everything comes after that. Uh, <coughs> thank you. And perhaps uh, I will also start with uh, with the, the comment made by the last speaker, uh, perhaps that reminds me a little bit, uh, the tension that you highlight there uh, is, is clear, and I don't think there is a straightforward narrative. The one way to think about it is, we are all familiar with this NIMBY phenomenon, not in my backyard kind of approach. And in societies where people have rights and their rights are protected, their, their vo they have voices, that phenomenon exists. But in societies where rules of law is not as strong, where rights are not well protected, they com those communities don't, cannot have such approach. Uh, I do think there is a tension there if everybody were to say uh, and take a NIMBY approach. Uh, by definition, these, the geology for these minerals are concentrated in specific areas. And some, if we, in, if we are serious about energy transition, there are some sacrifices to be made. Let's not uh, hide behind that. Where perhaps the way we are thinking at it the, at the EITI is prioritize the freedoms, the freedoms that I mentioned in the EITI civil society protocol over being too prescriptive about the rights because Rights sometimes can be negotiated. The rights to access to clean water versus housing versus, um, we have seen situations where communities are confiscated to move um, in exchange because they are gaining certain rights. They are accessing ed education. They are having better housing and so on. There are good examples. Um, I, the, I don't mean to list countries, I mean, a number of Western companies, I think it's fair to say, over the years have developed some robust standards here. I am very familiar with, for example, Freeport McMoran at some point that was developing mines where there had even a department about cultural heritage uh, just to understand uh, how society is affected. I, I remember visiting a mine in, in, in DRC where a, a cemetery, a, the mine, what do you do with a mine and where there was a burial site for people from generation before? Um, and there are very sensitive issues, cultural issues, and there the, the approach, I think, if we are to develop a standard internationally that can be too patronizing in some cases or uh, not necessarily fit for purpose in all situations. If we prioritize meaningful consultations, freedoms, that people have a voice, that the co they are, their views are considered. There is a saying in, in my country, in French, like, le oui n'a de valeur que si la personne dont il émane peut dire non. The value of yes, yes has only a value if the person who is saying yes can also say no. So it's just about ensuring that people have the freedom to, to, to provide informed consent. Um, and the, I, I do have some hopeful uh, comments for the person who said that he was depressed. Uh, I tend to be hopeful about this. We actually just, uh, sorry for uh, 
peddling this PR here, but we just launched a report which is relev relevant to this. Um, it, we call it mission critical, uh, strengthening governance of mineral value chains for energy transition. It's, we will come back to this issue actually in this room to discuss this report in for more the details later, I think it's in this room on Saturday. Uh, you are welcome to come back, we will discuss this in more detail. But the, the, the basic point why I am saying that I'm hopeful about this is that the, the practices, we actually know how to do this. There are, there are good standards, labor standards, good environmental standards, good social standards in the relocation of communities, in engaging communities, in, in doing this in a way that is respectful and meaningful, uh, to have meaningful conversation and that respect uh, cultural norms, etc. The, the other aspect that makes me hopeful about it is, a, so if you take Western companies, they have these CSR standards that they try to follow because of the reputational risk for reputational damage. But if you look at Chinese company, the, their CSR standards is not as strong. However, it, what we have seen in EITI member countries is that Chinese companies as a policy is to respect national laws. They will not go above and beyond the law, but what is in the national law, that's their by culture, is to follow the national laws. So what we have to do collectively is to make sure that there are national, strong national regulations that protects those rights, that ensure those freedoms exist, that allows for uh, those processes to be done in a way that respect uh, the, the, those, those communities' rights. So it's, it's not, they are not, those who are needing the re resources are not alien, we are all human beings. I think this is something that can be solved. I don't think oversimplifying the issue is helpful uh, or demonizing a sector or a, a region or a community. I don't think that is helpful either. Uh, this is a much more nuanced conversation and this is where we think robust transparency and dialogue is, is needed to move, to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's 2.45, so out of respect to whatever event's happening next, we've got to end. So just want to say thanks to all of you for coming. A big thank you to Cultural Survival for doing all the work to organize this. And especially thank you to our panelists for taking the time to be here and for what I thought was a really stimulating and uh, complex discussion. Thank you. Thank you and bye everyone. For those of you who have interpretation equipment, kindly return it to the entrance of the room. Thank you.